Greetings everyone! Anyone subscribed to this channel will know that I tend to flit between testing low budget camera lenses right up to some of the most expensive options out there, and the lens you see before you today certainly fits into that more premium category. It's the new Nikon Z 14-24mm f2.8 S. It is only for Nikon's new Z mount mirrorless cameras, it covers a full frame image circle and it costs a staggering £2,500 here in the UK, or just under US dollars I'd like to thank Nikon UK for loaning me a sample of this lens for a couple of weeks for testing, although as usual this is a totally independent review. Nikon have a history and a high pedigree in producing these ultra-wide-angle bright aperture zoom lenses, and for a long time their 14-24mm f2.8 lens for digital SLRs was the envy of many Canon shooters. Nowadays, both Sigma and Canon themselves make competing lenses, which are both great, so let's see whether this new mirrorless camera version of Nikon's classic professional lens can hold its head higher than the competition. That zoom range of 14 to 24 mm means that this lens is wide angle all the way, 14 mm being particularly extreme, so it's not the only lens you'll want for general shooting, but the zoom range is pretty useful anyway, particularly for getting shots inside buildings of all sizes or for landscape photography. The bright maximum aperture of f2.8 means it could also be useful for event photography and nighttime photography, so you're at least getting a very flexible optic for your money. This lens's build quality is really spectacular. It reminds me of my pleasurable experience handling Nikon Z 24-70mm f2.8 lens, and it's happily quite clear that Nikon's design team are following the same tune. The lens is metallic, solid feeling and tightly assembled, and looks incredibly cool too, with a fun, if slightly superfluous, OLED display on the top, which can be made to show different things. This lens is not image stabilised, although most Nikon cameras nowadays have image stabilisation built in. It weighs 650 grams, about 1.5 pounds, so it balances quite well on Nikon's cameras. Nikon state that the lens is dust and moisture resistant, and there's certainly a decent sealing gasket on the rear mount, as well as a space for rear gel filters from third party manufacturers. Then at the rear there's a customizable metallic control ring, which a lot of people might set to control their aperture, and you can see the display changing accordingly as you turn it. It turns smoothly without clicks. Then we get a rubberized zoom ring, which also turns fairly smoothly, and at the very top we get a rubberized manual focus ring, which worked with the focus motor pretty responsively in my test. This is of course an autofocus lens, now autofocus speed is hardly a top priority on an ultra wide angle lens, but its autofocus motor is reasonably fast and accurate, and makes a very quiet whirring sound as it works. However, if you're shooting in video mode, as you can see here, it slows right down, but becomes completely silent as a result, meaning that you won't hear any motor noise on a soundtrack from your camera's internal microphone. This lens comes with two different hoods, firstly a smaller one, made of plastic and of very good quality, flocked on the inside, which lets you put on a normal lens cap and secondly, an extra wide hood with its own extra wide lens cap, which allows you to use 112mm filters, which is awesome. It's great to use a polarizing filter with this lens, like this one from Hyder. Nikon themselves and other third party manufacturers make these large filters, although they are obviously expensive. If you put more than one of these filters on though, you may see vignetting in your pictures when shooting between 14 and 15mm. By the way, when removing a filter from this extra wide lens hood, don't grip the hood too tightly or it won't come out, and you might panic and think it's stuck inside forever, like I did for a little while. Overall, the lens has absolutely fantastic build quality here in every way, with some ingenious options for people who want to use filters. Now let's look at image quality. I'm testing it here on a Nikon Z7 with its full frame 45 megapixel sensor. At the widest angle of 14mm and the brightest aperture of f2.8, right away sharpness and contrast in the middle of the image are absolutely incredible, and over in the corners, a really brilliant performance there too, not quite as sharp, but very impressive indeed. f4, 
f5.6 and f8 only see the tiniest of improvements in image quality, but really, this is an awesome performance from the get-go. Stop down to f16 and softness begins to creep in from the effects of diffraction, as you'd expect to see. Let's zoom in a bit to 18mm. At f2.8, the middle of the image continues to be as amazing as ever, and this time, now that we're zoomed in a little, the image corners look even sharper than they did at 14mm. Finally, let's zoom all the way into 24mm. Again, at f2.8, that image quality is simply astonishingly good in the middle. And over in the corners, they are finally looking a bit softer, although they're still decently sharp. At f4, f5.6 and f8, we see gradual, small improvements. Again, stop down too much to f16 or darker, and the image quality will begin to soften due to diffraction. Overall, this lens's level of resolution and contrast across the entire zoom range is consistently brilliant. It's just about the sharpest ultra-wide-angle zoom lens I've ever tested, although it's not that far ahead of Sigma's recent 14-24mm f2.8 DG-TN option. Then again, that Sigma lens isn't available on Z-mount cameras, well, not yet anyway, so the Nikon lens is supremely dominant, if only over rather a small playing field. Let's take a look at distortion and vignetting. These are normally taken care of by your camera, but you can turn corrections off to see the lens's real performance. At 14mm, we see strong barrel distortion and heavy vignetting at f2.8. Stop down to f4, f5.6 or f8 to see that vignetting reduced, although it never fully goes away. Zoom into 20mm and that distortion flips over into a pincushion pattern. At 24mm, the pincushion distortion gets a bit stronger, and vignetting is still very heavy. However, stop down to f4 or f5.6, and the vignetting clears up quickly. Still, you definitely want to keep those in-camera corrections turned on. Now, let's see about close-up image quality. The lens can focus down to 28cm, about normal for a lens in this class. At f2.8, close-up image quality remains very sharp, although contrast takes a hit. Stop down to f4 though, and contrast makes a return, leaving us again with incredible image quality. Now, let's see how the lens works against bright lights, a very important question for any ultra-wide-angle optic. Some very light flaring is visible here, but it's a comparatively good performance here. Contrast is remaining very strong. This lens could be useful for nighttime and astrophotography, so let's take a look at its coma levels. Here's f2.8, you can see that bright lights in the corners show no real coma smearing, which is excellent. Let's take a look at sun stars while we're here. At f2.8, they're not visible. Even stop down to f8, they're not very well defined, but stop down to f11 and they'll blow you away. And finally, bokeh. Despite its fairly bright aperture of f2.8, this lens's ultra-wide-angle nature means that it won't be anyone's first choice for getting out-of-focus backgrounds. When you do get them, they're fairly soft, although difficult backgrounds may look a bit edgy. So, the conclusion I'm reaching about this ultra-wide-angle zoom lens is that it is more or less the best I've ever seen so far, although standards are getting higher and higher these days. Its only real problems lie in distortion and vignetting when shooting in RAW, but those are normal for this class of lens and easily corrected. Its price is pretty excessive though, to say the least. Is it good value for money? On the one hand, as it's such a premium optic, the lens in question manages to rise above such questions because there'll always be a market among photographers or professional photographers for the very best money, no object choices. Then again, Canon's competing RF 15-35mm L lens has a much better zoom range and its own image stabilisation system for a little less money. But then again, I've never tested it on a 45 megapixel camera and I strongly suspect the Nikon lens is a bit sharper, although I can't say for sure, and the Nikon lens does also have far superior build quality. Well, make of all that what you will. I'll never be able to afford a lens like this, but if it's within your own budget, then it's a dream to use, and it certainly comes highly recommended.